Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. This is your dynamic speaker. My role is to keep you awake after lunch. Talking about design, talking about love, talking about human centricity, talking about innovation, purpose, sustainability, talking about why the world today needs design more than ever. And when I say world, I mean before anything else, our planet and our society, but then also our business, businesses, and our companies. It's a very interesting moment we're all living right now. You know, we're witnessing a change that is happening in front of our eyes. It's a very exciting moment, actually. You know, when I was at school, I studied, as I guess many of you, this idea of the industrial revolution, the agricultural revolution. Today we are living, we are witnessing right now the digital revolution. A moment in time where society is changing radically. And we, we can shape this change. We can direct the, this revolution. We can decide if we want to tame the technologies that we have, that we are developing, and direct them towards the creation of a better world, or if we want to enslave ourselves to these technologies, that sooner or later we'll end up destroying the world, the planet, and the society as we know it today. So it's exciting, but it's also an incredible responsibility that we have today, not just for us, for the people living today, but for our children and for the future to come. I, you know, I'm an optimist by nature. I love to look at this as an, an amazing opportunity that we have because we're born in this time in history. So the world is changing in front of us. In the past 20, 30 years, driven by globalization, new technologies, the digitization we are experiencing today, uh, the way people connect with each other, the way we build companies, we build brands, is radically, radically changing in front of our eyes. You know, for instance, if we think about the way we create our brands and our companies, we're moving from a world where in the past we were crafting a story, we were crafting a narrative, and we were imposing this story top down with one way communication, one way uh, uh, storytelling to people, consumers, customers, the people out there receiving this story, believing in these stories, embracing these stories, often being engaged and inspired by these stories. This is how we've been building brands for the past 100 years and more. Today, this is radically changing. The companies and the brands are not even the actors of the conversation anymore. They're not entities talking to somebody. They're most of the time, they are the topic of a conversation happening amongst people. So we're moving from a world where, in the past, you were buying the right to talk to people, to a world where, today, you need to earn from buying to earn the right to be talked about, often not being even part of the conversation, to be talked about in the virtual world of social media and beyond. So the move from buy to earn implies that it's not anymore a society where the more money you have, the more resources you have, the more access to media channels you have, the more you can impose your message. In the world of earning the right to be talked about, you need to be meaningful to people. You need to create products, brands, propositions of any kind that make sense for people, that are relevant to them. Else they're, gonna talk, they're not going to talk about you. And you need to craft stories that are authentic, that are real, because they're going to check what you're, to what, what, what you're talking about. They're going to check what you're doing. And so this implies a complete, a complete shift in the way we build these brands and these companies. There is another thing that is happening, that is changing this scenario. Today, any of us, any of you in this room right now, can get access to funding for a brilliant idea in a much easier way than 20, 30 years ago. We live in a world where the culture of the startup, the culture of creating new uh, companies, new brands, new enterprises of any kind is pretty uh, accepted, is normal. There is this proliferation of incubators, uh, funds, even companies like the company I work for, PepsiCo, even companies have entire teams working on new ventures, investing in new ideas. People out of school today, they don't dream anymore just of joining a big corporation. They dream most of the time to build their own company, to eventually sell to the big corporation later on. So it's a very different world where, once again, you get access to 
funding for your ideas, the cost of producing your ideas is going down, driven by, once again, new technologies, globalization, and digitization. Today we'll talk about AI. For instance, AI is going to play a very, very important role to drive those costs down even more. And then you can go straight to the people you serve, what we call consumers, customers, the people out there, selling them products through e-commerce and building your ecosystem of communication through social media. So essentially, these were all the areas where the big companies in the past were building their barriers to entry. Barriers to entry made of scale, of production, of distribution, and communication. Go fight, go compete with Pepsi if you are just a person you know, without the resources of this company, without the billions of dollars that this company can afford to invest in communication, to invest in marketing. It was difficult in the past. Today, this is happening over and over and over again. And the proliferation of all these new products, these new brands, are creating on one side for all these companies, eventually problems of market share. But mostly they are creating problems of mind share or love share. They make these big companies, these brands, less interesting, less inspiring, obsolete in some way, if they don't change. So now, the only solution for the big ones and for the small ones is just one. You need to refocus everything you do, the entire culture of the company, what every function and capability in your organization does on people. You need to understand what they need, what they want, what they dream, what they desire. You need to create something extraordinary for them. You may have a product that is very good, you may have a brand that is inspiring, but eventually it's not sustainable enough, it's not purposeful enough, it's not healthy enough. It's enough that you don't have something, and this is exactly where competition will come in. Creating a product that eventually is equivalent to yours, a brand that is equivalent to yours, but solving the problems that you're not solving for people. And while before, in the past, eventually in your industry, there was this uh, dynamic balance and the different competitors were playing by those rules, unwritten rules, today everything is different. And there is the possibility to disrupt entire industries. And either you do it with your company, or sooner or later somebody will come and will do it in your behalf. We live in what I like to call the age of excellence, an age in which either you produce excellence at 360 degrees, products, brands, service, uh, the entire ecosystem of your product, brand, and company, or somebody else, sooner or later, will do it on your behalf. Some companies call it consumer centricity. I like to call it human centricity, this kind of approach. There is a, you know, words are powerful. There is a major difference between looking at people as consumers and looking at people as humans. At school, at design school, they taught us to look at people as people, as users, as humans. Uh, if you look at people as consumers, you're gonna think of them as those people that buy your products. The moment in which they buy your product. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna try to do everything you can with the levers at your disposal to sell them products and grow your business. If you look at them as humans, if those people, your, your consumers, you look at them as, as if they are your kids, your parents, your friends, people you care about, the keyword care, love. Well, then all of a sudden, everything changed. You wanna create something extraordinary for them. You really wanna create something that create values in their life. They respect the, uh, their lives, they respect the society they live in. Human centricity is purposeful by definition. They respect the environment they are in. If you're really human centered for real, obviously you're gonna respect the world where these people are living. And the world where the future generations will live because what we're doing today is gonna have an impact on what is gonna happen in the future. Now, this is not just about people. It drives business growth too in this new scenario. We live in a moment in time in which, for the first time in our modern, uh, recent history, financial value is finally meeting human value. Before it was not the case. You could grow your companies without creating eventually human value. Today you need both. And if it's not happening right now in your industry, it's about to happen. Because somebody will understand that, that, is, that that's an opportunity to enter in your industry and, and change the game. Now, this approach, what we call human centricity, I am a designer, is what we do as designers. This is, once again, what they teach you at school. 
Often we think of design as beautiful products, fashion, uh, consumer electronics, uh, incredible packaging, but the reality, the design is much more than the output we see all the time out there. It's much more than product packaging, it's much more than aesthetic and form. Design is, before anything else, a way of thinking that leads you to create meaningful solutions, products, brands, experiences. Designers start always with an obsession, a healthy obsession, for people. We care about people. We want to create something valuable for them. We get excited when that user gets excited by the use of our products and brands. It's both rational and emotional. It's aesthetic and it's functionality. You, you are driven by that. Then they tell you, well, designer, you know what? <laughs> Your products and brands, they also need to make money for the company. And you need to understand also the technology world to understand how to make them. There is the feasibility and the viability dimension, there is technology and business, but everything starts and ends with this care for people. And this is what our world needs today, this is what our companies need today. This culture of care, this culture of love, the fact that no matter what are the regulations out there, no matter what drives the business of your company short term, you have people inside the company that what they dream of, what they desire, is to do the right thing. Then they will figure out how to make everything else work. It's not people that think, oh, I need to grow the business of this company to the extreme, and then I will see if sustainability, if creating value for people, if purposeful branding is a lever that I can use. But if I can't, who cares? There is a radical, radical shift in mindset a different kind of leadership, as you've been talking about in these days. The same thing is about connecting these three dimensions, viability, feasibility, desirability, and then prototyping around these dimensions, creating stuff quickly. It's about finance, HR, marketing, design, R&D, all these different functions working together, hands in hands, with a focus on people, understanding these three lenses, and creating from the very beginning, prototyping on a post-it note, a rough mock-up, and then oh, uh, you, uh, you scale more and more and more these ideas all the way you arrive to market. Eventually, you prototype in market as well. You validate, you learn, you fail, you fail, and you extract further learnings out of those failures, and you evolve, and you change, and you arrive to the real meaningful innovation. That's why it's not something that you can outsource to an agency and in six months they solve all the problems of your company. It starts from within. It's the culture of the entire organization. Then, yes, you can work with tons of agencies, but you need to change from within. And it's all about, therefore, building experiences, no matter what is your industry, that are meaningful to people. Understanding people. Understanding the people, this is history of humanity, take decisions driven by two drivers, their rationality and their emotions. So even if being more sustainable, being healthier, making certain choices that make sense for society are rationally things that make tons of sense and everybody should just choose for that, the truth is that people buy things driven also by their emotions. And so when we want to change the world, it's not just about doing the right thing, but it's also about inspiring people to follow you in doing the right thing. Or eventually they want, if the right thing implies compromises and trade-offs and sacrifices. And this is really what design is, is about, finding the balance between emotion and rationalities, building experiences that are meaningful to people. There are three steps, three different uh, levels of relation we always take in consideration when we try to inspire people to use our products and brands. And they come from human science. They come from the way we interact with other people and the way we interact with the world, with the environment, with spaces that we explore in our beautiful planet. The first one is what we call the visceral relation. It's when you see an interesting person, an interesting man, an interesting woman, and you're like, wow, it's the butterfly in your stomach. It's something that really attracts you viscerally. It's beyond your rationality. You are attracted by something. It's like when you see a beautiful landscape. You are on a beach in the Maldives. You are in front of the Grand Canyon in the United States. You are in front of the Hopper House of Sydney. And you're like, wow. You are excited by what you see. 
This, uh, this needs to happen also when we create our products, our services, our brands. Wowing people is the first step to drive them to embrace your purpose, your cause. This is an example of Pepsi as an example. This is a short video introducing the new design that we just launched of Pepsi uh, a few months ago in the United States. We'll arrive all around the world, including here in Singapore, in, uh, in the next few months. A design that is all centered on the black color, the black color of zero sugar. We are repurposing all our communication from coolers to cans, to everything we do when we talk about the brand on Zero Sugar. Zero Sugar, that is not a big chunk of our business for now, but we're really trying to force uh, consumers all around the world, people all around the world, or around the world to embla embrace this different formulation. This is a very basic, the most basic example I could think of, of how design can help nudging a better behavior. This is what Fast Company, the business magazine Fast Company uh, in the United States wrote when we launched the design, the best Pepsi looked in decades. But a few, few days later, they came up with another article that is by far more meaningful than this, that totally understood what we're trying to do with the redesign. Pepsi's new logo is a subliminal war on sugar. So introducing this idea of black across the board in the communication, in the visual identity system, shifting, you know, there is this eternal war between blue Pepsi and red Coke, as you may know. Shifting this is a dramatical brand change for us as a, as a company and as a brand. And therefore, it's something that uh, is disruptive within our own organization, trying to nudge that kind of behavior even within our own company to really push something that is better for the people out there. Now, this visceral relation, and uh, you can build it with the design of your company, design your brands, but also with a series of different kind of initiatives. For instance, we play in our company a lot with limited edition packaging. This is something that we created um, for Pepsi, once again, during COVID to celebrate the frontline workers. This is another brand that we have in the United States. It's called Stasis. They, we make uh, pita chips. The founder is a woman, is Miss Stacy. And so for many, many years, we've been using this brand to help women, to support them in a variety of different ways and to create a series of initiatives, especially focused on women entrepreneurs like Stacy, the founder of Stacy Pita Chips was. Or even when we invent new brands from scratch, this is a, a water brand. Uh, um, the, all the bottles are RPT, recycled PT, and there is not a common design identity for the brand. Every bottle is always a different collaboration with different artists. And through this brand, we support the creative community and a variety of different minorities within that community. So the purpose that we have in the brand, in this case, is totally, totally embedded on the reason to exist of the brand itself. So the first goal with this visceral relation is the one of make, inspiring people, Maybe making people fall in love with your products, with your brands, but you can apply this also to yourself, to your personal brand, to your idea uh, of creating a new organization, to your drive and desire to change culture with a, within a company. Create stories, create content to inspire people, to make people fall in love with that idea. So the first one is boom, you know, they get excited. They don't even understand why. They're just excited when you talk, when you present a product, you, when you present a brand. Then there is, there is the second step. We call it the interactive relation. And now I go back to what I was describing earlier, this balance that we have in human beings between rationality on one side and emotions on the other. This is when you go out with this interesting person and you enjoy the moment with him or with her. It's both emotional, you feel it in your guts, in your heart, but it's also uh, rational. You reflect on the moment. You're in vacation in a beautiful place. You feel that you're privileged of having that opportunity of being in that vacation, but also emotionally, you're just 
enjoying it and having fun. History of humanity, always a fine balance between rationality and emotions, and the success or failure of many of the products that we launch, the initiatives, the experiences we create, is all based on finding the right balance between the two dimensions. Too many times we're driven by functional reasons. We think that if we make something that is more sustainable, if we make something that makes sense rationally for people, they will buy it, they will embrace it. And then we get so surprised if they don't. But this is not how we work as human beings. This is something we've been considering, for instance, when we launched this platform a few years ago called SodaStream Professional, where we created these machines to customize your dreams. You arrive with a reusable bottle with a QR code, or you can have your app in front of the screen, the screen has a camera, and recognize you. It reminds you, in the software, the first thing you see is how many bottles you're saving from the environment. Emotional feedback. And that gives you satisfaction if you use the machine over and over and over again. But then you can uh, customize your drink. You start from water, you can add uh, flavors, decide the intensity of those flavors, carbonation, the temperature. You can add functional ingredients, vitamin B, magnesium, electrolyte, and, uh, and a variety of others we're working on. So we are personalizing the experience for you. We are making it fun, engaging, and we're giving you something that you can get just through a machine that you couldn't get through a normal bottle. So to the pain of carrying the bottle with you everywhere, that is a major trade-off, is one of the key reasons why people don't buy the reusable bottle. They, they just love the convenience of buying a plastic bottle, drink, and throw it away. To that pain, we fill the gap of the pain by giving you something that you wouldn't get if you just get the bottle out there in, on the shelf. It, by the way, working on four macro trends that are impacting every industry in the world. Sustainability health and wellness, personalization, and then the fourth one is overarching the tree, that is technology, and technology is an enabler to do things that you don't expect, eventually even in your industry. You know, I did my thesis at the Polytechnic of Milan as a designer at Design University in wearable technologies in the late 90s. When I joined PepsiCo 11 years ago, I was like, well, it would be a dream to apply the idea of wearable technologies to food and beverage, but how can you apply wearable technologies to food and beverage? We sell potato chips like Lay's, we sell Pepsi, we sell Gatorade, we sell a variety of different brands. And then we came up with an idea. And this is the story of that idea, Gatorade GX. Your game is our lab. <laughs> Introducing the future of sports fuel. Gatorade GX, your real-time hydration coach. Gatorade GX tracks fluid loss before, during, and after training, capturing every moment of sweat, measuring electrolyte and sodium loss in real time. Fluid intake is continually monitored with on-the-fly guidance, showing you when to hydrate while pacing your intake. Analyzing your fluid balance, Gatorade GX unlocks your personal fuel strategy. Recommending fuel formulas based on your electrolyte and carbohydrate needs. Conveniently delivered through an innovative equipment system. Replacing what's been lost when you need it the most. Track, analyze, and optimize your performance. Gatorade GX. Built to fuel. Customized for you. This has been an extremely, extremely successful uh, product for us. And in the Q&A, if you want, we can talk more about how we arrived to that success because it's not been easy and we have failures before arriving to that success. But again, the formula we identify, we found, is this, always this balance between rationality, we give you something that makes sense for the environment, that makes sense even for you, and then emotion. We inspire you with something that gives, that adds some form of value. This value is both functional, you can customize your drink for you in both the previous case and in this one, but also emotional. We play with the bottles, you can customize the bottle, you can put your name, the name of your team, you have we have different collaborations with artists and with athletes, so you can carry this bottle around and it's all about another human need, self-expression, with something that is aspirational, is cool, is meaningful and relevant. 
So the second phase is all about uh, having people enjoying both intellectually and emotionally your story, what you're pushing, your brands, your products, your vision, what you're trying to create within your company. How can you have people understanding what you're talking about, but also being inspired by what you're talking about? Really feeling in their guts, even before the rationality. And then the rationality somehow is used to justify a decision that was already taken in their guts. The third relation is what we call the expressive relation. Going back to human science is when you come back from that date with this uh, interesting person, and you want to share the experience with your friends, with your parents, with your family, with somebody that will care about what you felt in that experience. You are back from your vacations and you share the pictures of those vacations with everybody, eventually in social media. This is pretty common today. It's when you are, you are having an experience that is so meaningful for you, so relevant for you, that you want to share with the rest of the world. For instance, think about the guilt that many people have of being associated with the world of sodas, they are using plastic bottles, they go in the environment. And this is one of the reasons why PepsiCo, a few years ago, decided to make a major multi-billion dollar acquisition of a company like SodaStream to start offering Pepsi, the possibility to create your own Pepsi at home with a machine like this. So you can have tap water, the carbonator, and then you have the pods to create your drink at home is why PepsiCo is the first company worldwide to, that, that, that has invested and put on the road the new Tesla trucks uh, that you can see now running for the time being in the United States with our brands. And it's why we're doing many, many things to try to nudge the world in different directions, from the way we're investing in materials, recycling uh, material, materials, different form of packaging. Here you see something that we just launched to re remove the traditional uh, shrink wrapping of, of the multi-pack uh, to the communication, to invite people to recycle. Communication that we connect to events in the world of music and sports, in fashion, always trying to inspire people because it's not just about this. You know, what we learn in consumer research all the time, all the time, people tell us, look, when we drink a Pepsi or, or, or with uh, a pack of lace. We just don't want to think about the problems of the world. We just want to indulge. So it's complicated to invite people to think about those problems because they are important and try to nudge different kinds of behaviors while you respect the fact that they want to indulge, they want to have it easy, they want to have convenience, they want to have fun. And so it's always about you know, doing the right thing while we inspire them with a variety of different initiatives, working at 360 degrees. Licensing merchandising, for instance, has been a very important driver of us to create the engagement, to have people feeling excited or being associated with Pepsi. You are excited both because they're doing the right thing in a variety of different ways for the environment, and both because you love the fun that they generate in a variety of different ways. And these are a few examples of different brands that we have in our portfolio from, from merchandising and licensing all the way to the experiences we build in space, uh, in different parts of the world with all the different brands that we have, in the physical world as well as in the digital world. Always thinking about this connection between physical and digital in this new digital world we are living in. This third relation is all about making people being proud of being associated to you. Not a shame. They could even, you know, it's pretty obvious in the luxury industry. You may be proud of being associated to a luxury fashion brand, to a luxury car. It's less obvious in this kind of industry and eventually sometimes you may be even be embarrassed of being associated to some of the brands out there. So how can you shift that both, once again, rationally and emotionally by doing the right thing in a purposeful way and driving business as well? Visceral, interactive, expressive. This is what human-centered companies do. That's the starting point, the user perspective, the human perspective. But now, as I said earlier, there is also a business advantage of doing that. If you apply the visceral filter, if you create things that wow people, well, you're going to drive emotional impulse purchase. People with a list of things to buy, they bump into your products, they get excited, they, they get surprised, and they buy into your product, your brand, or your proposition of any kind. The interactive one is emotional satisfaction and loyalty. It's line of people out of an Apple store to buy the latest Apple product even before they ever experience it in their life. Expressive is communication and spontaneous PR. 
having people becoming the ambassadors of your initiative and multiplying it, amplifying it exponentially in an authentic way because it's not anymore you, your company, your brand, talking in a positive way about yourself and celebrating your company, your brand, but it's people out there now celebrating the experience with your products and brands. Purchase, repurchase, recommend, the business perspective. But we say that the human-centered perspective is the most important one, is the starting point and the end of this cycle. Create wow effect, create engagement that is both rational and emotional, and then create pride in people of being associated with your purpose, with your initiative, with your company, with your brand. Pride that is generated by rationality, but you need also the emotional variables to generate that pride. Now, to move from this to this is a journey, and in the Q&A we can talk more about the journey, but one of the key drivers of the journey, the key enabler of the journey, is the people. We often talk about processes, frameworks, ways of working, but at the end of the day, it's all about having the right people inside the organization, inside the company. And in this slide, you see a long list of characteristics of these people. We call them unicorns, or people in love with people. I'm gonna leave it up here as we talk uh, right now, and as we answer your questions, we can go into some of these characteristics. I wrote them down 16 years ago, the first list. It was a little bit shorter, when I was at 3M, in the tech company uh, of Minnesota, 3M, because I needed them to find the right people for my organization. And over the years, I've been testing, validating them, and uh, they became my compass for my personal growth, but mostly a very, very important filter to identify not just the designers, but at this point, by years and years and years, many of the people we interact with in all the other parts of the organization. This is the key driver of everything we do with human centricity in the company, is the kind of leadership you've been talking about today, and is really what I call people in love with people. Is the love for what you do, the passion that you have in doing what you're doing every day, is the love for the people you serve. It's not about growing businesses. It's not about making money. It's about creating something valuable for people out there, for their planet and for society. And then it's love for the people around you because it's not a one woman show or one man show, but it's really a collective effort. And every single person, everybody has a role in this. And once again, we are living in a moment of major change. We are in the middle of this digital revolution. People in 100 years, time, we read about this in history books. We are here and we can direct this revolution in a direction or the other. I hope we're gonna direct it in the direction of love and human centricity. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Uh, your job was amongst other things to, uh, to keep us awake and you did that incredibly <laughs> well. Have a seat. Uh, we've been talking all morning about the fact that innovation, innovation, innovation is, all, is what we need to solve for uh, existential challenges like climate change, socioeconomic inequality, uh, and other existential challenges that we have today. So what does, uh, what does design, human-centered innovation, et cetera, have to do with sustainability? Well, look, uh, there, are, there has been also a big debate in our own design world between this idea of human centricity and environmental centricity. There is people that think, well, human centricity is gonna generate a disaster for the world because you're gonna put people, human beings, on top of everything, including the environment, you're gonna destroy the environment on the on, in the name of this. I do think that that kind of interpretation is based totally in the wrong uh, understanding of what human centricity is about. And I, I can explain it with a, with a simple analogy. Think that the consumer, the user you're focusing on is your daughter or your son. I have a daughter, she's one year and a half uh, uh, old. So, of course, if I care about her, I'm not gonna destroy the room she played, the house where she lives, the garden where she go plays, the environment, the planet where she lives. So this idea of design centricity, that is this idea of human centricity, is totally, totally in line with the idea of environment. In fact, if you go, to, I've been going to design conferences for 30 years, 
Sustainability was the main topic of conferences 30 years ago, 20 years ago, before the business world wa wa was ever talking about this. And these designers would either go into companies, try to change the game. Many of them instead were just frustrated by the fact that the game was not changing. So I'm really sincerely excited by the fact that in the past few years, the game I think is changing and society is driving this change. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, you described very briefly the list of uh, characteristics that make up a unicorn. These are the innovative people that you're looking for to use the concepts of design thinking and human-centered innovation to be the innovators. Um, is it easy to find such people? No, it's a nightmare. <laughs> now, how do you find them? It's, if it's, I could have unicorns and my, all of my team members were unicorns. It, it's my most, the most difficult part of my job, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's the most difficult part of the job of many of you having teams, right? Finding the right people. So again, the first step for me was to become aware of what those characteristics were. That's why I wrote them down literally from night to day in a piece of paper, thinking about the amazing innovators I met in my life and thinking about my life, what I did wrong, what I did good, and, you know, I came up with this list. Then again, over the years, I tried to validate and, 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 uh, the list, mostly by hiring people, working on, um, on projects. And then at a certain point, I started to talk about this publicly in conferences. I, I would do interviews. I wrote a paper for the Design Management Institute review. And why? Because I needed, I needed the people out there they were like this, the people that would recognize themselves in this list of characteristics to come to us. I also wanted to have the people that didn't have those kind of characteristics not to come to us. If I talk about love and kindness and optimism and curiosity, if you're not that kind of people, you know, probably you don't even come to us. I also established a very solid relation with multiple recruiters specialized in our design work over many, many years, many years so that these people know inside out what I'm looking for. They know perfectly well. Also because they've been part of many mistakes that we made together. And they have a network of people out there. And so I use also them. And then finally, I know that I have biases. I know that I see things and I don't see many other things. So I leverage the diversity of my leadership team mostly and then other people inside the organization to interview these people so that I will see certain things, other people will see other things. We all know our compass is the characteristics of the unicorns, and then collectively we, we discuss what we see, mm -hmm. and, then, and then the last thing is we need to embody those characteristics. For me, embodying them, demonstrating them every day has been very, very important, and it's difficult because nobody has them to the, to the extreme, and so you need to force yourself every day to be the best version of yourself on the base of those characteristics. So it's a pretty long list. Are there uh, two or three absolute must-haves that, that I should look for while recruiting uh, to find these innovative people? Yeah, look, I'll mention two groups. One is pretty obvious, but often doesn't happen in these companies. The other one is totally not obvious, and I think it's been a secret uh, uh, um, weapon. I don't, lo I don't love the word weapon, so I was trying to find another word. It didn't come. But anyway, something very important, a secret driver of, of what we've been doing the past few years in PepsiCo. So the, the first one is the ability to dream, to think big. This is what every innovator in the world has in common. They think big. This is what, by the way, every single person in the planet, when he's born, has. The ability to dream, to fantasize. We have it as children. We dream. And then, over the years, people around us start to tell us that dreaming is childish, it's very naive. But many of us keep that ability to dream. You go to school, you get out of school, and you enter these companies. And you think that you can change those companies, those brands, industries, the world, you know, young people have these dreams. And then the society reminds them that you cannot dream, that dreaming is naive. And many of us start to think that actually Yes, it's wrong. We should be more practical, more concrete. This is real life, the real world. We st should stop being children. And so many of us stop dreaming because society doesn't want us to dream. Dreaming is destabilizing. You know, it's difficult to control. And so we stop dreaming, but some of us keep dreaming. The problem is that just dreaming is not enough to innovate. You know, many of us eventually, the dreamers may just lay there in the comfort of the dreams. You need to find a way to dream and act, 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 fast, by the way, speed is key, execution and dreaming, 
is very important. And that's why design thinking is a very interesting methodology because it pushes you to prototype quickly. Even when you are not ready, your idea is not perfect, start to prototype. So this, uh, this ability of thinking big and executing is key. Now, if you read books of innovation, usually in a way or the other, they tell, they tell about this. But the reality is that in companies it's not happening, and we need to be very clear about that, the importance of having these two variables to be the ambassadors of them and push them. There are others that are less obvious. Kindness, optimism, and curiosity out of the 26 have been, for me, really, really important. Curiosity is what drives you to learn and see life as a never-ending opportunity to grow and, and really becoming every day the better version of yourself. Curious people read books, they talk to people, they travel around the world. I tell my people every time, if you travel from New York City, where I live, to Singapore, or to Shanghai, or to Sao Paulo, or to other places around the world, do not spend all the time in a meeting room. Get out. And I'm gonna pay for it, but get out and get lost in the city and bump into strangers and talk to people. And this is the best way, first of all, at least in the worst case scenario, at least to inspire you. Then you may even learn things that you can take back to work and grow as a, as a person at work. Curiosity is one. Optimism, if you try to change things, if you drive innovation, you will face roadblocks all the time. So you need people that see the glass half full. Now, partially you have it, like all the characteristics, there is a part of the book where I talk about these characteristics that talks about uh, the fact that part of it is natural. We're all born with all of them, but to develop them, you need to practice. You need to invest in them. And so some of us lose some of those characteristics because we forget about them or we forget about the importance of them. Mm -hmm. So optimism is something you can practice, remembering where you're coming from, remembering the dream, and trying to get out, put things in perspective when you're living the difficult moments. The last one is, is kindness. That is really the game changer for us. It was characteristic number zero when I put it in the list, mm -hmm. and is what really drives you to work with others, to respect others, to build trust in the team. And all of this, and I will make it very short, but I could talk for a one, one hour about this, all of this drives productivity. <coughs> Kindness drives productivity and effectiveness of teams. And today, that productivity is more necessary than ever in this hyper-accelerated, hyper-competitive world we live in. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, I think we will look at that list in more detail. So I'm going to get to the questions from the, th from the floor, and I'll go straight to a difficult question, which has the maximum words, uh, but I'm sure you've heard it before. Uh, the products Pepsi creates and influences customers to buy is all about creative marketing, leading people to buy unhealthy products equals chemicals. How is this sustainable? <laughs> it has the maximum words, so Ooh. I had to ask it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's somehow sad, you know, often to receive these attacks because it means that we are not understanding the company and we are not doing some research to better understand the company. Uh, Pepsi is just a component of our business. We have 20 brands above the billion dollar. We have 40 brands between $250 million and the billion dollars. We are making huge, huge investments in creating, in buying products and brands that are more sustainable, that are healthy, that are good for you. So we are moving the company towards the right direction. We need people out there to embrace this. If, we, if I make a product, if I'm pushing zero sugar, if I add to my portfolio water brands, if we have a variety of different products that are all about health and sustainability, we need people to buy them. We need people to pro, uh, pro, uh, uh, promote them. We need People out there, instead of just pointing a finger at these companies, saying, well, they have this, but they are changing direction, and celebrate that change of direction, amplify this as much as possible so that our kids start to use and consume different kind of products so that you can then build the conditions for the world to change. So this is a collective effort. When I joined the company 11 years ago, with Indra Nui, the famous CEO Indra Nui, driving this idea of performance with purpose, I was like, wow, it's gonna be easy, it's gonna be fantastic, we're gonna change the industry, we're gonna be part of this amazing journey. And then I realized very quickly that the company, the companies don't have the power of changing these industries. You need people, unless you're like, you know what, I'm gonna stop producing all these things, eh? and then yeah, do, you destroy these companies, and therefore, you know, the life of many, many people, hundreds of thousands of people working in these companies, and the investments in the pensions of many people that have been investing in this company. You destroy all of this, 
just for all of this to be replaced by another company mm -hmm. is going to do exactly the same thing. So change, real, purposeful, sustainable change is a collective effort. And we need companies, we need the media, we need governments, we need different kind of entities, and at the end we need people out there to drive all of this together, to drive this change together, and celebrate all the efforts that these companies are doing so that they can do more and more, and they can inspire other companies to do the same. And so this is very important. Let's change the narrative and let's say, wow, you're doing this, do more than, thi than this. And we need the other company to do the same and the other one to do the same. And by the way, people out there, we need you to buy that stuff. Yeah. Because you have power. We have power. We, users, citizens of the world, we decide what to buy. Nobody forces us. We decide what to buy. So we can change the world from night to day if we change our behaviors. Mm -hmm. So some of these companies are trying to nudge this change of behavior, but it's not easy. So we need all of us, conferences like this, to really, and, and the media especially, all of us together, together, to drive this narrative, this narrative of change. So uh, in, like the story you told us about, you came up with those plastic bottles, uh, replaced the plastic bottle with a, uh, with a uh, reusable bottle, but nobody wanted to use it. So the point you're making is that, you know, yes, you can throw darts at the company, but uh, consumer behavior has to change, and the way to do that is to stop buying those products. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I told this story last night. Uh, it, the brand is called Drinkfinity. You may still find it online if you Google it. Mm -hmm. and it was a very similar product to the Gatorade bar that you saw. The difference, though, was that we were not personalizing the product for you. It was a reusable bottle with pods. You were using tap water. So a project that if I did it at university, I would have got maximum grades because it was on paper perfect. You know, it's sustainable, it's beautiful, it's healthy. Uh, we had all kinds of functional ingredients. You could buy drinks with turmeric, with matcha, you know. But people were not willing to have the trade-off of carrying the bottle with them. Gator has been successful because we created this functional value of personalizing the drink because the brand is inspirational and aspirational, so kids want to be seen around with their brand because you can customize your bottle so there is that emotional. So a series of additional new benefits that you can get just if you reuse the bottle, if you go through the pain and the lack of convenience of reusing the bottle. What else is uh, in the pipeline in terms of how the company is making a change towards a little bit more sustainable products. Anything Look, else you're particularly I, I, proud of? I, I'm going to tell you, you know, the long-term vision, because obviously I cannot disclose, you mm -hmm. know, things that you will see in the market sure. in the coming years. But we know that we live, in a, we, we, we live in a world in a few years where you wake up and you have some device on your body. It could be a patch, could be the Apple Watch or some other brands of watch. It could be, some, it could be a tattoo. When I was at Philips and I did my thesis, we were thinking it was going to be a tattoo. Something that is monitoring your body. When you wake up, the intelligence in the home will, will tell you, good morning, good morning, Mauro. I know you didn't sleep very well. I'll be like, what do you mean? I, I thought I slept so well last night, and, but the your wearable devices know more than you what's happening in your body. They know also your history, they know the agenda of the day, and, and they know everything about your life, and they're gonna customize, they customize drinks and food on the basis of what you need and what you love. Now, it could be a drink, it could be a cookie that is 3D printed in the morning, so you will have what your body needs, and then you still wanna go for lunch to have a good, in my case, pasta asciutta, spaghetti with clams, or a salad. You want all of that. But you will have products, drinks and food and snacks that will help you compensating eventually the lack of balance that you have in your life and in the way um, you eat and you drink. And so it's a, it's a very interesting shift in, um, in the overall industry, moving from problems, that, like the one that you mentioned, to a world where snacking and drinking in the same way will be fun, indulgent, but also creating value for you. So this is where we're working for. We're going towards that, and this implies four different things. One is there is an acquisition strategy, new ventures, so we invest in companies of different kind. Then there is innovation from within, when we have patents and we have things that make sense from within. You saw two of them here today. And then there is also what we call quick cycle innovation. So our experiments that we're doing mostly on the uh, digital channel that many people don't notice, but that we're doing to learn and grow and feed the other pipelines. Very good. 
Okay, another one which has many words. Uh, can you elaborate on stewardship? When you say many words, I'm afraid. Uh, no, this one is not so bad. <laughs> this one's not so bad. Uh, can you elaborate on, stu it's bad, but not so bad. <laughs> can you elaborate on stewardship responsibilities of designer brands? Many, quote unquote, bad companies, uh, e.g. Prime Energy, use social media influencers to address e easily malleable customers, like kids, to boost sales. So what is the responsibility of designer brands when it comes to stewardship? Uh, a, a lot of a lot of players are using their power to influence kids and others to yeah. consume bad stuff. Yeah. So, what should be the responsibility of these designer brands of which? Look, I, I think if you're doing that, you're not a steward leader. Yeah. You're not a one of those people in love with people. Mm. Look, beauty is being used in history for good things or for bad things. You know, the architecture. Uh, art has been used by governments, uh, kingdoms of different kind, monarchies, religions, so in good ways or in bad ways. So design, beauty, and anything you do with design is just a tool. You need the right people behind it. And that's why for me that list of characteristics is, is the driver of everything. I want the right people because I have the right people. They will use those tools. You will talk in a few minutes about AI today, including AI, any new technology for doing good. If you have the wrong people, they will use it, you will use it to do bad. Now, big companies are on one side entities that need to grow, business growth. So the company will push you to using levers to grow the business. But then they are made of people. So if you have people with good values, the right kind of people, decent kind of people, they will find all kinds of ways to grow in a positive, good way. If you have the wrong people, they will grow in ways that are not good. So it's, it's very important to have the kind of approach. Gotcha. Um, quick question. Um, some people think that a sugar tax is coming and that's the answer to the problem of obesity. Your thoughts on that? Is that a good idea? Look, I am a designer, so it's not really my field, and I would say things that <laughs> I, is, this is, you should ask somebody else inside the organization that are working on this. Thing. Okay. All right, so then, last question. Innovation is what we are all after, in every which way, in every company. Uh, you've used design-centered, human, uh, design-based, human-centered innovation all your career in 3M and now here. Uh, final advice, if somebody wants to create a culture of this kind of innovation in their organization, what would be your one or two tips? The most important things. How, long, how long do I have? Three hours. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, there are five steps that I defined when I was still at 3M to grow this kind of culture. And it's been actually the topic of my interview with Indra Nui when she interviewed me for the job. Uh, the first one is what I call denial when you try to change culture, but the company is in total denial. If you stay in denial, your company is going to disappear. M the most of the time, at the beginning, companies are in denial because they try to protect the status quo. But sooner or later, somebody that needs to have the right level of credibility, resources, uh, and, and responsibility, therefore it needs to be either the CEO or somebody at the top of the company, understands that you need to change. And they inject the change agents it could be people that they hire. It could be many of you that are, uh, you are hired to drive that change. That happened to me when I was at 3M and they hired me to drive that change. It was a very safe bet. I was 27 years old in Italy, at the periphery of the American empire of 3M. So even if I was going to fail, nobody was going to realize. So here I am, I take my suitcase, I go to Minnesota, I meet all these leaders in R&D, in marketing, in finance, and they pitch this idea of design and human centricity, what you saw today, but with 20 times more energy because I was 21 years older than today. And, and people loved it. The, everybody got excited. Now remember going to the office of my sponsor, the EVP of the consumer business, Dr. Monozari, telling him, Mo, it's incredible. Everybody is embracing this idea of design that can change the company we do, the way we do innovation. Monozari that was always very serious, that day is more serious than ever. He looks at me and he's like, Everybody's lying to you. Like, what, what do you mean? No, I'm more, I was here, you know, I was there, I have empathy, EQ, I feel people. And it's like, I'm telling you that everybody's lying to you. 
And then he goes on and he explains with an analogy. He told me, look, imagine if you are in an art gallery and in front of you there is a beautiful piece of art and you have your pockets full of money. What do you do? You buy the piece of art. Well, Mauro, you are one of the many paintings in the art gallery of our company. There is design, but there is also the next projects in R&D, there is the investment in the plant, and so on and so forth. And I know that all these people are not buying design, they are buying other projects. I know because I gave them, Manozari gave them the budget. And so that was a big aha moment for me. I realized that I was living what I called later the phase of hidden rejection. That is a phase that every time every company goes through when you try to change things. Because once again, the body of the company, the vast majority of the company, reject change to protect the status quo. It's a human instinct. So I developed back then a technique to try to identify who was going the people that were with me and the ones that were not, because that was very, very important. Every time I would pitch something and somebody tells me, oh, I love that idea, I ask them to invest in that idea. Give me the money. So if they don't, I will know who is with me and who is not. I need to find the people with me. In average, they are one out of, of, of 10. 10% of the people are the ones that are with you when you try to push that change. And in another, in another time, I will tell you why 10%. There, is, there are data behind. But once you find them, you move to the third phase, what I call the occasional leap of faith, is when you find these co-conspirators, I like to call them in this way, and you start to create proof points. One proof point, two, three, four, five, until you build a critical mass of proof points. At that point, the company is like, wow, this thing is not just the fed of the moment, is real. Let me invest for real on this. And you move to the fourth phase when you scale up the initiative. Now, everything changed. The risk is higher, more money, more visibility. I call this fourth phase quest for confidence. You are changing everything. You need to protect the love, the pirate approach, the pioneer mindset, but also now you need processes and scale and everything is different. In this phase, you need to protect the confidence in the organization to drive the change because usually those processes kill the change that you have in startup mode. If you succeed there, you move to the fifth phase, that is what I call the holistic awareness. The new culture is part of the DNA of the company and it's not the end, it's the beginning of a new That's cycle true. because you don't never want to stop. Wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of takeaways. There's also, for each tough question, some nice comments for your presentation. Thank so you. thank you again very much. Thank you. Thanks. Pleasure. Thank you.